we are two miles north of Home Depot on Highway 93, on the right hand side, right north of the Humane Society, where the window okay. places and Great Bane. And that's where we make all the body care. And we start with fresh ingredients from Two Bear Farm and um, Terrapin Farm, they grow a lot for us. And uh, then we make body care as natural as possible. So, do you make it commercial? Uh, or do you just teach classes there? We make it commercial, yes. We sell it there. We have a factory store, so you can come and check the products out there. We sell it to wholesale, that is like Third Street Market. Whitley's has it, Sun Drop, Sun Life, uh, here in town. Even Rose Hours carries some of our items, and then Blacktail Grocer. We sell online and at the store. And then we also have classes, like when you go to the website, there's an event page in there, you can see the classes, you can sign up for them, um, you can call in and make a reservation. And we have classes once a week, where we teach how to make your own body care. Thank you for coming to this workshop today. Um, my name is Anna Graf. this is my husband Charles, and we both uh, own Kettle Care Organics. And at Kettle Care Organics, we make uh, natural skin care. That is our mission, to make it as natural as possible. And we go through great lengths in order to achieve that. Because the reason we have so many chemicals in our skincare is it makes the life of the makers much easier. It's way easier to work with chemicals than with just natural skincare ingredients. However, we are very, very passionate about using natural ingredients. And so we go through great pain in order to achieve that. Klaus is a very, very good chemist, has helped out tremendously. And today we want to show you um, and teach you a little bit how you can make your own skincare, and uh, and so I would like to take you on a little journey here. Um, let me give you all a little bit of lavender. And lavender is like wine. Every lavender plant smells a little bit different. Every variety uh, is just pull up. imagine. Imagine that you're hundreds and hundreds of years back. You're living in the wilderness, and you're waking up wherever you are, and you're smelling this lavender that you have in your hand. So rub it a little bit in your hand, and what happens is by doing that, you release the essential oils that are in that. And you have gathered that lavender the day before, while you were walking through a field, you picked it up, it's very fragrant. You held it on some kind of injury that you had the day before, and you wake up in the morning and it is so much better. And you like to scent, all the anxiety from the day before is gone. And so your body intuitively knows this is a good plan for me. And I think that's how we as humans learned instinctively, intuitively, little by little, the beneficial properties of each plan. So you're waking up and you're starting a new day and you walk through the fields. And there are wildflowers, there's an abundance of variety that nourishes your body and you instinctively know what is good, what is bitter, what is healing, because you're still in total sync with nature. And you know which berries to pick, which ones are poisonous, which ones are nourishing you, which ones are healing. And you end the day uh, just like all the animals around you. You are part of that nature. You are not uh, confronted with chemicals. Your skin is part of the nature. Your body is part of the nature. You came out of nature and you will go back to nature. And you know that very instinctively. I think it's better if I do it next. Yes. Uh, just like the animals, because at night you will fall asleep, just like the bear, and um, the next morning you get up and you're indulged in nature again. And for that reason, next please, we believe that we are part, we here at Kettle Care believe that we are part of that nature, and we really strongly believe that what we put on our skin is extremely in, uh, important, because um, we believe that we make natural body care, body care as natural as possible. Right? Yes. Because 60% um, of what we put on our skin gets 
absorb directly in our bloodstream. So this one will not get filtered out by the liver. It will not get broken down by the enzymes from your saliva, by the stomach enzymes. It goes straight in your bloodstream and it affects your organs. So we believe what you put on your skin is actually way more important than what you eat because it has such a great effect. If you imagine the nicotine patches, you just put a patch of nicotine on there and it can give you such a jilt that you don't have to smoke for the rest of the day. Uh, when we talk to pharmacists, they say if they can have something um, supplement in a cream, it is way more effective than if they prescribe it to be ingested. And for example, with progesterone, they have to give it 10 times higher doses if you want to ingest the progesterone versus just putting it the cream on your skin. That's how absorbent the skin is. Um, the skin is also our largest organ in the body and it's very, very uh, important in order to detoxify the body. So if you put chemicals and toxins on top of the skin, it's A, not good for the detoxification process, and B, it actually toxifies your body at a much higher rate than if you would ingest it. So for that reason, um, we are very excited to show you today how we utilize fresh botanicals from Tuber Farm, from Terrapin Farm, where they are grown organically, and then the other ones that are not grown in Montana that we can't get locally, we purchase. And they're all either wildcrafted or organically grown. And we would like to walk with you through three uh, processes. One is the essential oils and hydrosols. The other one are extracts. And then we have oil infusions. And Klaus will go ahead and take that part and I will hand out the botanicals. Okay. So, essential oils and hydrosols, they, they go hand in hand. So I think you all have seen in stores essential oils for sale in little bottles for outrageous prices. Um, they're quite expensive, especially the smaller bottles, so we buy by the gallon. So for us, they're not that expensive. Um, you can make them yourself. We do show that in one, some of our workshops. I think we showed it at the Maker's Fair last mm -hmm. week. And you can see here, this was at the Maker's Fair. So this is a small uh, essential oil distill. You can buy that on eBay if you want to or some other sources. And there we made something we called Wilderness Perfume. And Anagrid is handing that out. So we just made some essential oil there and some hydrosol that was based on pine, spruce, cedar, juniper, and balsam fir. And you can smell that, and we call it walking in the woods. So you can put that into your bathtub with some bath salt, and then close your eyes, and you have the feeling you're in a forest. So there are a lot of things you can do yourself with your own essential oils. Um, if you grow your own botanicals, um, if they have essential oils, you can distill them like that. It's not very efficient for businesses, because it takes about like four big lavender bushes to get about one ounce of lavender essential oil, and lavender has a lot of essential oil. So that's why we don't do this for ourselves. You'd have to have like a 200 gallon vat that you're distilling this stuff in. But for yourself at home, you can run this quite easily. Uh, I think on eBay, they run around 200 to $300 a kit, a complete kit. So they're quite affordable. Let's see. Essential oils can be made, or there's lots of different processes. We only use two kinds. One is steam distillation. We'll talk a bit about what steam distillation is. The other is supercritical CO2 extraction, which is similar to what is being used for dry cleaning nowadays, where there's no solvents involved. And then there's organic solvent extraction. We don't use those kind of oils at all. And that's usually based on that it's really difficult to get the solvents out of your essential oils afterwards. So the first two we do use for us, and we'll talk a bit about this. Steam distillation. So this is a bit more involved diagram than the one I showed you, but it's the same principle. Basically what you do is you take water, you make steam out of it. The steam goes through your botanicals, which are in here. And then it heats up the botanicals, and the steam takes the essential oils with it, and water solubles. 
And then that goes up like in a distill from making alcohol into a condenser here and condenses down into a, another vessel. And there you usually have a water oil separator. The essential oil will float on top. Underneath will be the water, and that water is called a hydrosol. It's called a hydrosol because it has the water soluble scents in it. And then when you smell these, um, they smell close to <laughs> what the essential oil smells like, but more like a tea very often. And you can buy those too. So if you buy things online or in stores, for example, lavender, you get the lavender essential oil, and you can also get the lavender hydrosol. They'll smell slightly different, but both of them are fully usable. So a lot of like mists and other kind of things, you use more of the hydrosols, a little bit of the essential oil. In creams and lotions, you'll really be using the essential oils only. Um, if you want to find out how to, <laughs> how to dilute them, usually, good rule of thumb is you don't want to have more than 1% of essential oil in your product, whatever it is you're making. And you can try more, you can try less, but if you go above 1%, you better make sure that there's no reactions or other kind of things, or it doesn't throw you on your back because it's smelling pretty strong. So it's around 1%. 1% uh, is easily measured with a scale. Now, if you're making very small batches at home, that becomes a problem, right? Because now you're trying to measure 0.01 grams or something like that, 10 milligrams, right? Uh, you will not have a scale like that at home. So you can use the rule of thumb drops. Now this is not very scientific. Um, it's about as good as being between milliliter and fluid ounces. Things get pretty challenging at some point. But usually, if you have 30 milliliters, that's about a fluid ounce, not a weight ounce as it says there. And there will be roughly 600 drops in there. And this is really rule of thumb. It could be anywhere from 400 to some more, depending on how big your drops are, how viscous that oil is. But that's a good rule of thumb. So with that, you can sort of get a feel for how, how much do I put into uh, oil. So if you have one ounce of essential oil, six drops, which is one hundredth of 600, is a good starting point. So that's for yourself. Try things out. And all the, let's say, I'm going to show a few recipes or other kind of things. They're all public domain. So it's, it's very simple to go on the internet to search for those kind of recipes. Uh, we teach classes at Glacier High School and we made lip bombs and hand bombs, those kind of things with them. You just really go on the internet and search the stuff and then you can make your things yourself. Yes? So for your steam distillation, the, the diagram you had back there, I presume you're using like a Bunsen burner kind of a thing to heat it? And well, no, it, yeah, I, I would use an electric heater. Electric heater? Yeah. Okay, have you ever seen any models that have, that use firewood? I've seen people on YouTube showing giant uh, crab boil gas burners, high pressure gas burners with 100 or 200,000 BTU on their big stein stainless vat. Yes. Okay, so you can only do wood on it if you're doing it for a massive scale, huh? Well, you can do it on a smaller scale. I, I would just be, I would just be careful that you don't get the smell of the burning wood into your essential oil oh, and all those sure, things, so, sure. uh, unless you're challenged with financing how to heat it. I don't know if I would do that. And it's a lot easier to control temperature with electric or gas, sir. Right, I imagine with wood, the biggest issue would be that it's not a fully consistent off-putting. Yeah, it'll be hotter and colder and all yeah, those yeah. things. Yeah, I, I'm way off grid and don't have the electricity. Yeah, and, 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 and it'll work. So as you're using, as you're boiling water, you can't really overheat it, right? It's just you're boiling more water, so it'll be more steam. So the only thing you're gonna run into is you have to make sure you have enough cooling for your condenser. Cooling for the condenser. Okay. Yeah, because that, that is depending on how much heat you put into your water to evaporate the water. Or, so if you have more heat underneath that, it won't go about boiling temperature of the water, but you get more steam. That means you have to condense more, and that means you have to cool more. That's all that it would take. Let's see. Another thing to use, uh, extracts. So we'll talk a little bit about extracts. So the first one was essential oils and hydrosols. Always go together. The hydrosol, almost said, is a waste product. It's a byproduct of making the essential oil. That's why the price is so much lower. It better be lower. If it's not lower, somebody is ripping you off. Um, they both are usable. Extracts. 
So now there are other ways to extract, uh, let's say, the goodness out of your botanicals. So depending on what you're trying to use and what property you're going to get, it can be somewhat different for different botanicals. And extraction, you can use different kinds of extraction fluids. One is water, that's more like a tea, and those work very well. Um, they have limited shelf life, so whenever water is involved, bacteria can grow, so then you have to think about shelf life and preservation. Um, if you don't want to use preservatives, you better, what you make, use it up quick. Or keep it for sure in a fridge, and then beyond that it becomes a bit more challenging. So when you buy extracts, and if they're just water-based, they will have a preservative. That doesn't always mean that they declared it on there, but they should have. Next, the other one is alcohol. They're usually called tinctures, so you can use for yourself something like vodka or you got Everclear and dilute it down. Everclear doesn't have the smell of vodka, those kind of things. Um, then you call it a tincture. Good thing about extracting with, with uh, alcohol is you get all the organics out of your botanicals. So anything that is not a salt or something like that will get extracted with alcohol. So that's why usually the majority of the tinctures are alcohol based. The other good thing is you don't have to worry about preservation. So as soon as you're above 30% uh, content by volume, you are self-preserved. You cannot spoil. It's like liquor in your shelf. Right? So that's the good part about alcohol. So the majority of the tinctures you'll see will be alcohol based. There, you can also use glycerin. Glycerin has the advantage you extract uh, some other solubles out of your botanicals that are, let's say, like sugar-based, sugar-like. That all will dissolve in glycerin a lot better than in alcohol. And then there are other organic solvents. So when you buy extracts, there are things like butyl and glycol and other things that they use as extraction liquids, which are very good for extracting but there's definitely nothing natural about it. So go look at your bottle to see if they declare how the extract was made. Yes? Have you ever heard of anyone using uh, hard apple cider as an as a alcohol source to tincture? Well, You can be, uh, use apple cider, and it is a good extraction method. The reason we didn't mention it here today is Apple cider has a very, very strong scent. And we played with it, especially in our workshops. And it's just not a pleasant scent. Even if you use it as a hair rinse, that's very beneficial. Um, people are not pleased with it. It's, when it comes to skincare, you want to have a good and comforting scent. And so that's why we didn't mention it here. It's just, and when you put it on the skin, it's a lingering scent and you're like, so it's kind of strange. Just the hair, at least you can rinse it out again. Uh, but that's why I didn't mention it up there. Yes, you can extract when you do extractions for yourself, like a garlic apple cider, cider vinegar extraction. That's great as a salad dressing. You can do that. Works really well. The extract will be more like a water-based extract, because the alcohol contents will be a couple percent or so. It's not preserved. You'll get a little bit of extraction from the alcohol parts of it that would be in there, but really it's going to be like a water extract. Y yeah, and yeah, people don't tend to like the vinegar scent as a skincare product. For other things, it works well. So extract instructions. So I didn't talk about essential oil instruction. If you buy an essential oil distill, they usually will have the description in there how you do it. It's quite straightforward. Um, for extractions, you basically put uh, botanicals into uh, a glass, glass jar, preferably, not plastic. Why not plastic? Well, there's all these publications about things that can leach out of plastic that are not good for you. So glass a lot better. Uh, ideally, a dark brown glass. If it's not dark brown, then you have to put it into a dark place because UV light can start decaying your, your extracts and the good parts in your botanical. Fluorescent lights, you will have some UV, or so they better have a plastic shield or a plastic glass in front of them that filters the UV light out. Definitely don't put it in the sunlight if it's a clear jar. Um, 
you cover it with your extraction liquid. So if you want to have it reproducible, you should note um, which ratios you're using. A lot of them are usually like four or five to one if you had a dry botanical in terms of five times or four times extraction fluid to one times of your botanicals. And there's plenty of public domain knowledge out on the internet too that you can just Google. And change the jar several times. You can go up to six to eight weeks. If it's not preserved, I would go less, sir, because then we're back in the preservation discussion. So for alcohol-based ones, tincture ones, you definitely can go that far. Uh, strain with a cheese class, press out the plant material. You can send it through a coffee filter if there's like fine stuff in it. And then start store in a dark, cool space up to seven years if it's alcohol-based. Yes? So if you do something that's more water-based and potentially more susceptible to rot or whatever, uh, have you ever heard of anyone pressure canning that and then having that work out? You know, and like then you have to boil it, yeah. So then yeah, the question true. becomes in terms of what of the ingredients that you haven't extracted are temperature sensitive or not. Some can be. Some can be. You have to do a little bit of research then to see which one of the ingredients would be, might get destroyed by the temperature treatment. Sure. But that, so, that, is, that, will, that does work for some things. That would work for some things. Cool. You definitely, yeah, it, it'll be like canned vegetables, or and you know what you lose on ingredients and canned vegetables, you lose some more things here. So that's another reason why people like to use alcohol. It's self-preserved, you're done. All you need is a dark brown amber glass bottle. Oil infusions, another way. So if you plan on doing something like a lip balm or a salve or all those kind of things, then alcohol-based extraction is not going to work for you because those are not compatible with the end product you want to make because uh, you have alcohol and oils in your lip balm, the alcohol is going to disappear and then you'll have particles of all the extracts floating in there. Huh? So now you have to come up with a different method. That one's usually oil fusion. It's also if you just want to make like a massage oil that has some botanicals in there, oil infusion is the way to go. So what's an oil infusion? Uh, See, so here are some different examples. So comfrey and arnica are usually big ones. Arnica, you wildcraft. Comfrey grows like a weed here once you start it. Um, they have very good healing properties. So if you pick a nice oil, you can ch choose some different oils and we'll talk a bit about that. You can rub it on your skin and get some very good performance. You make it part of a lip balm or a hand balm, even better. Coloring ingredients, we also use, we do not use food coloring for our products, anything like that. Definitely not red. So red is plenty of publications where there's a lot of doubt if they're carcinogenic or not. Uh, try not to get in that discussion. Uh, we just don't use them. So we make our own colorings and we have an example there, which is based on alkanet root. So we make an oil infusion with alkanet root. So you buy a chopped up alkanet root, put it into oil, and let it sit there for a couple of weeks and you'll see in there, you get this dark red liquid, oil. You make that part of your product, when there's one of our lip balms that's colored with it, it looks like red food coloring. And it's all natural. So if you have other rings, you can think about beets, red beets, and other kind of things. Definitely, it's very easy to get rid of the red. And then there's a couple plants that will give you some yellow coloring too. You use something like calendula with fancier oils, and fancier oils like jojoba oil, argan oil, those kind of things that have their own set of properties. So you can get very creative in the kind of products you can make. How do you make an oil infusion? Same as an extract, you fill it in a glass jar. You're, you're again in the four to one realm somewhere. You can go higher, you can go less concentrated. Just remember which ratio you did use for what you're doing so that if you want to make it repeatable that you know for the next time you use so much of the botanical and so much of the oil. The absolute amount is not that important uh, except for reproducibility. And thing that is, yeah, heat it up. We heat it up. Um, that's the thing you want to decide. Preservation, again, I mean, you have botanicals that are natural. There will be some microbes and other things on it. You put it in a cold oil, keep it in a cold oil. It's a big question what will happen to those microbes, sir. So I think you really do want to heat it up. And if you do heat it up, do it in a double boiler. Don't blow your kitchen up. 
Um, if your stove overheats it and you get past the flash point, and there's your oil fire. Um, so a double boiler is the way. So yeah, in our plant, everything is totally metric. We used to have these other units and cups and teaspoons and tablespoons. It's not manageable in a, in a manufacturing environment. So we're all metric in our company. So if you have to scale recipes and all things, how do you want to scale a teaspoon and you want to get 20% more? Or, so it's those kind of things. So 100 degrees C, well, it'll be a bit lower because you had higher altitude here. Um, but once the water boils, that's why a double boiler, you know you're at that temperature and you're fine. And if you stay there for somewhere like 20 minutes, for sure anything that is alive, microbes and other things will be gone. Um, we usually uh, simmer it a bit longer. You can try with your botanics how long they have to go. So depending on how chunky they are, you might have to go a bit longer or a bit shorter. Then <coughs> um, you strain them, same as an extract, and you have your oil infusion. Keep it in a dark jar. They will also last a while. Um, they're more limited by oxidation. Basically, the oil will go rancid. There. So you have to prevent oxygen or minimize the oxygen that can get to your oil. So you want to have as little air in the jar, a little dead space, as you can. If you get fancy, you can put CO2 or something else in there, or nitrogen to blow out the oxygen. It'll last longer. Then you have the same UV light challenges here, too, so dark brown glass. And that's why it says start in a cold place. The oxidation goes a lot slower when it's cold. So it gets, takes longer to, to get rancid. We did this one for a workshop where we went outside. We looked for a plantain. It usually grows in your lawns. You can find it on the side of the road. It is that wheat that has these big round leaves and then it has these stalks coming up when it starts to bloom. And so we used that in our oil infusion workshop. And here we just took a gallon jar and dried the plantain a little bit to get the water out. And then we covered it with oil. And here Aaron is shaking it up on a regular basis. And that's how you can make your own oil infusion at home. So here we have a little recipe that we like to use. We don't sell this product, but it's a nice little recipe that you can use at home by using actually what we consider weeds here in Montana. It is the chickweed. Again, you find that in abundance in a shady lawn uh, if you didn't treat it with herbicides. Um, you can find the plantain and then we take a cube. How much is a cube usually that we make uh, in the workshop? How many grams? Oh, our little beeswax, beeswax cubes. cubes. They're like a milliliter. Yeah, it's one gram. Yeah, take a tablespoon, a teaspoon of beeswax you can put a few drops lavender essential oil in. The kajaput helps to prevent the itching. Um, a little bit of peppermint oil that also helps with the itching because the menthol will uh, evaporate. It's pretty nicely, uh, works pretty nicely. So that's one of the favorite uh, products that we make in one of the workshops. We fill it in a little tin like this one and then our customers can use it throughout the year. And this will be in the handout that I will email you. So you don't have to necessarily write it down. So as you see, this is not metric. So in our workshops, we use equipment that you have in your kitchen. So we'll use cups, tablespoons. As a double boiler, we'll have a pot with water on a stove and those kind of things. So it's exactly how you would be making it at home. Yeah. So now we thought we'd talk a little bit about the botanicals that are beneficial for the skin. Do you have any, before we go any further, do you have any uh, questions to the process itself that Klaus just explained? Yeah? What's that um, oil that you made? Yeah. Um, so that's listed in the ingredients like on the, um, so it's just like a, like a drop for coloring and that's uh, actually, the alkanet oil, the question was how we utilize the alkanet oil that we just passed around, the red oil here. We actually use, it depends on the product, we use either 100% of that oil or we just mix it with other uh, oils. In the case of the lip balms, our lip balms are a symphony of five, six different oils so that it's really emollient and heals the lips. So we use that alkanet oil and then we use some other ones. Some, you can just use the alkanet oil, then it has a much stronger color. 
Um, it depends on how you want to use it. So you so can dilute it, it down. Uh, it doesn't, not that I know of, that I would really claim it has any healing properties. So we the utilize was, the color. So the it, I think, has healing properties of itself. Is that yeah. correct? No, yeah, that, and that's just the coloring and then like the lip balm is, you have the cherry almond and it yeah. has a cherry um, fragrance to it. So I just wondered if it had a fragrance. I'm just curious about it. No, so does alkanet root have a fragrance? No. What you do is you pick one of the oils that you would have used in your lip balm anyway and use that for your oil infusion with the Alkanet. So that way you can get enough of the Alkanet in and you get the oil that you want for the properties you're looking for. And that's where the healing part comes from. So if you pick the right oil for the healing properties, you make the oil infusion with the Alkanet and then with that oil infusion you make your lip balm or your hand balm. Yes? <clears throat> as far as the substrate goes, like the actual thing you're making the infusion with, whether it's alcohol of some kind or oil of some kind, what's the what's the best option as far as locally produced things that you've come by? Because like coconut oil, obviously, we can't, you know. We have, here in Montana, we actually have a very, very good option, and I will show you that at the end of the um, slideshow we go uh, in one of them, a very good question. Yeah, the question was, which kind of oils, uh, alcohol or extraction fluids we have available locally here in Montana. So we mentioned one of, we actually do, and I'm very excited about that one. Uh, any other questions to the extraction processes or essential oil processes? Then we will go and look at these botanicals. Let's start out with Annika. This is how Annika looks when you go in the forest. It's scattered around shady areas. You find it in all kinds of elevations. It starts actually in April already, depending on how soon the uh, spring comes out in our lower elevation, and then it goes all the way up to August, the higher you go. Our Annika is wildcrafted, and uh, it is for us, it is very important when you wildcraft that you're very conscientious and uh, about the wild crafting method. So we harvest one flower in 10 that are there. We make sure that you know you pick one and then you take a few steps, you pick another one. So it does take a while to uh, pick those Annikas. And you can see when you go to areas that are very available to the public, Annika has become very fashionable uh, to wild craft in these days and then I see patches where all the flowers are just taken away. So please don't do that, leave it there for the next year because otherwise we deplete that uh, environment. We really want to leave the abundance there that it can seed itself. It also grows through the root system, but harvest about one in 10 flowers whenever you do wild crafting. And when it comes to roots that you want to wild craft roots, be even more careful and take even less because it takes way longer to regrow and we are in a very high elevation up here in Montana, and it takes long for uh, the vegetation to recuperate. Um, Arnica, we, it's, it's a pretty amazing plant. When you dry it, it dries to, um, the dry flower changes completely, just like um, Lubinson. Dandelion. Dandelion, sorry. Just like a dandelion, it be uh, becomes the flower of a dandelion, and when you blow at it, all the seeds fly away. So be very careful. I had it once where I had a patch of arnica, and I just wanted to leave it out a little while longer for the drying process, and the wind picked it all up, and it was gone. <laughs> I was like, okay, we have to, once it's at that drying process, we want to keep it inside now. But that's how you learn it the hard way. It was like one blow of the wind, and it all took off. So that's, uh, that's a normal drying process of the Annika, just expect it. It won't stay in this flower like that. It's really interesting. So how does Annika work? And we learned that from an herbalist, Britta Blödon in Missoula. She had a really good analogy and she said, imagine that you're on a highway and there's a traffic accident and the traffic backs up and people get out of the car, run to the accident to help. Other people are this there to call and do everything. And way down there at the road is the ambulance and the fire engine, and they cannot get to the accident to help. So what Arnica does, if you, it's really good, especially for soft muscle tissue injuries, 
and if you put it on immediately, what Anika does, it acts like the traffic police, gets all of those cars out of the way and helps the fire engine and the ambulance to get to that injury. So the quicker you put Arnica on uh, overworked muscles, the quicker you put Arnica on that soft muscle tissue injury when you fell, the better it can work. You will see that it might still hurt, but you will not get that tremendous black and blue spot that you're expecting. It is very, very powerful. It works great for overworked muscles. We love to use it before we go hiking, especially in springtime when you're not used to it. We put it on our legs after we finish the hike and it invigorates you. It's, it is great. However, because it has such a strong healing power, keep it away from an open wound because it might cover the wound much quicker and there might be a lingering infection underneath it. So let it dry up and then you can put it around that open injury but don't put it directly on it because it, it heals it way too fast and we don't want that. Um, that is the power of Arnica. The next one that we love is Calendula. And this is, oh yeah? So almost kind of similar to the idea of ice, like where you would put ice on a soft tissue injury, you could put Arnica on instead. Um, the question was if, uh, if Arnica works similar to ice, the quicker you put it on a soft tissue injury, um, how would... I don't think it's similar. So ice, you're trying to prevent the swelling, huh? mm -hmm. really. So it, it slows a lot of the metabolism down where you're putting it in. So that's how ice works. This actually has a, a direct effect on how your body starts to react to and work on your injury that you have. So it's really great like if you really hit yourself and you think you're gonna get a black spot, you put this on in time, it won't get black. Okay. You have a very good chance it will not get black. Yeah, we were surprised. Yeah. I am deeply impressed. The next one is Calendula. That is grown for us uh, by Terrapin Farm, so we go out on a regular basis and pick it. And we utilize the Calendula resina, and I will pass that around as well. It's nice and golden. The flower, as you can see, is much smaller than what your garden calendula. And when you pick it, it is very, very resonant. It's resonance. It actually sticks to your fingers. When we pick it, we have our fingers covered in that resin. And that is what we want to capture because that resin is the healing property of calendula. And that is a really great one that we use in an oil infusion where we use jojoba oil. And jojoba oil is a very waxy oil and it is very similar to the sebum of your skin. And so it's one of the oils when you have compromised skin like a burn or eczema or just your skin doesn't want to have anything else. It is one of the oils that just sinks in and your body goes, oh, this is just what I needed. And we use that and infuse it in that oil and we refuse uh, calendula in it. And calendula is called the mother of the skin. I will pass the oil around and you can put a little bit on your skin and you can see how it feels. And it is a great combination because calendula is soothing. It heals um, skin infections. It is really great to prevent any kind of yeast infection that that injury might be exposed to because you have compromised skin. And it can just um, repair itself at a much quicker rate. So this oil is often utilized by uh, patients that go through radiation treatment and allows their skin to breathe. They put it on so they have the healing properties it gives them the skin that is so compromised and can <coughs> barely work. It uh, gives it the nourishment and hydration, but it also allows the skin to breathe really nicely. And it doesn't have to do too much because it's so similar to its own sebum. So if you look for anything, if uh, people have eczemas or like for little children where you don't want to put too much uh, outside sources on the skin, the jojoba calendula is a great way to start out with. Um, we really, really like that one. Then we have chamomile, and it's the chamomile German. There's a Roman chamomile. We use that in essential oils. And the German chamomile, I will pass that one around here. Um, 
we utilize in our oil infusion and we also make an extract. Yeah, mm -hmm. we also make an extract. So when you look at this little tube, these, the powder that you see, all of those are seeds. So chamomile is, um, once you have it established in your garden, it will show up everywhere. It's pretty, it can be pretty in invasive. And it's a really nice plant. Actually, in Victorian times, they had it along the walkways in the gardens, and people loved to um, go out in the gardens, and when they meandered around, their skirts uh, hit the chamomile, and it, it um, released that amazing flavor of the chamomile. Also, chamomile is called the physician's plant, because what the monks discovered um, is if you put a sickling plant next to a chamomile plant in nine out of 10 times, that plant will recuperate. That's how strong uh, chamomile is. It has a nice fragrance. If you have too much of it in the garden, you can just strip it out, put it on the compost. Uh, but it's great to just have it here and there and not just have a homogenous garden. Just let it grow wherever it pops up and rip it out where you don't need it. Um, chamomile is very soothing to any kind of inflammation, to any kind of infection, uh, very calming to the skin. We use it a lot when you look at our skincare ingredients, we use it in a lot of our products. It's nice and it's very, very beneficial. Then there's lemon balm. I didn't bring a sample of the lemon balm um, simply because dried, you cannot rub it, you, you cannot see it, it's just the leafy uh, a thing just almost like the nettle. Uh, lemon balm, when you are going in the garden and you clip these, uh, clip the leaves and you rub them in your hands, it has a citrusy, nice uplifting scent. It's pretty amazing. Lemon balm tea is very beneficial if you like it. It's very refreshing in the summertime. We use it because it is also antiviral. So we have it in our environmental barrier lip balm to prevent any kind of virus infections. We have it in our muscle rub that we also use as a chest rub uh, for um, uh, if you have a cough or some kind of, if you feel under the weather. I put that muscle rub with the lemon balm on my neck. Uh, it saps out any kind of uh, sore throat. It works just really nicely. So if you use it in muscle rubs, in um, recuperating muscles or if you feel under the weather in any kind of those formulations, the lemon balm is very uh, beneficial for uh, skin issues. Then we have lavender and lavender you were holding in your hand before. I can also pass it around here. Lavender is like wine. It smells different depending on the plant. It smells different depending on the season, how much water, how much sun it had on which kind of ground it has grown, and which kind of elevation it has grown. So lavender is never the same, and uh, it, it, is, it has a variation of wine. Um, lavender is, for skin care, just amazing, because it is an adaptogenic that is oil balancing. So if your skin is too dry or too oily, and you add essential oils of lavender to the, your skin care, or a lavender extract, or you make an oil infusion out of lavender, it balances the oil production of your skin, which is really <coughs> nice, especially for facial skin. Uh, it is highly anti-inflammatory, so it is great for slightly acneic skin, and also wonderful for sensitized skin. In addition, it has a great aromatherapy effect. As you saw when you rubbed the lavender earlier in the session, it's very calming, very soothing. It is recommended if you are under stress, if you are pregnant, it works really well. Also keep in mind, I told you earlier that 60% of what you put on your skin gets absorbed directly in your bloodstream. There are three areas on your body where, that, um, where anything that you put on there gets um, absorbed at an even higher rate. Do you know which three areas those might be? The here? Um, actually, it is the sole of your feet where you stand on the ground. It is the palms of your hands with which you touch your environment. And it's the uh, scalp 
Uh, it's very important. That's why hair care is so important that you don't use parabens in your hair care. That many people um, would also like to stay for, away from sodium lauryl sulfate because it is uh, aggressive. So also watch your hair care because your scalp absorbs it. And especially when you have little babies where the soft spot is not closed, be super careful what you use in their hair care or oils. Um, and I always remember it is you stand on the ground, you have the, the you touch everything and this is exposed to heaven. Uh, so the question was, is when do you harvest the flowers? When is the right stage of that flower to harvest it for uh, extraction or the processing of the oil? We like to harvest it before the flower almost, I mean, it's just about to open, or it's just open. So not at the end of the flowering process, but at the very beginning of it. Yarrow is nice. Uh, you can also use yarrow, the, the leaves of it. For some of them, you can use the leaves. Uh, but right when it starts to flower, at that very the first few days, then. It's premium time. Yeah, the premium time. Because I grow a lot of calendula. I have that, and I, it's sticky in my garden. Yeah. It goes up everywhere. It's its own kind of weed. But, but I, I looked at it, and I don't know when I'm supposed to. Yeah, so really right when the flower opens, that's when you're, that's the prime that we consider. Another one is comfrey. So if you have a dead corner in your garden, the comfrey plant is amazing. If you ever want one, come to us at Kettle Care. We gladly give you one in the spring. Just give us a holler and we dig it out for you. It spreads, you cannot kill it. Comfrey is really, um, it attracts the bees, which is wonderful. And we use the leaves and make oil infusions out of it. You can make extracts out of it. It's cell rejuvenating, so regenerating. It's great when you had a broken arm to put poultices on it, where you make basically a mash out of the leaves and then put it on that area. Um, it's for skin issues, it's soothing for skin issues. So go and play with the comfrey. The other one is here, for example, we have a little recipe for an pre shower and bath oil. You take basically, and you can take the ratio the way you want to do it. You take your botanical oil infusions, you add some shea butter, or more available in a grocery store is the coconut butter and then you add the essential drops of your choice. And you start with the 1% dilution, and then you can go up and see how strong you want to have to scent, depending on the essential oil and depending on how your body is tolerating uh, the essential oils. So that's a really nice way to use these amazing oil infusions of chamomile, calendula, comfrey. Um, here is where I wa we wanted to show you what is available. We have triple divide seeds. You can see them downstairs. Uh, Judy from Terrapin Farm is also there with her farm. She's there with triple divide seeds and with the Montana Organic Growers are downstairs. So check her out. Her seeds are available, or it's a, it's a uh, co-op actually in Montana. She's one of the growers of the seeds. They actually hand sort those seeds. It's amazing the process they go through. Support them by going to Third Street Market. I know Withy's carries them, and most of the natural food stores actually carry the triple divide seeds. So check out that is their logo. Plus, then they're they, all organic, and they have heirloom seeds too. Yeah, That's very really very precious ones, and they have the calendula resina that we were talking about. Another one is the oil barn. So we are very fortunate in Montana that we are. Um, the second largest organic certified acreage we have in Montana after California. And California is the greenhouse of the nation. So imagine that. We have the second largest certified organic acreage in Montana. In the U.S. In the, U in the U.S., yeah. In Montana, in the U.S. Montana has it. And um, we would like to support those Montana growers. And one way you can do that is to get the oil from the oil barn. I you check out the natural food stores if they don't carry it ask them if they can carry that oil because it is made in sandy montana and it's part of the crop rotation of the montana organic farmers who grow chickweeds they grow lentils safflower i think sunflower i don't know uh, but if you are an organic grower you have a five-year crop rotation so you cannot always go from wheat to corn you have to have different crops and if you want to learn more about the Montana Organic Certified Farmers, want to have a good summer read, or now before, you know, while we still have snow on the ground, go and get a copy either from the library, uh, library, imagine if, 
or buy it on, on, uh, online and it's called The Lentil Underground. It's an amazing story that tracks the organic farmers. It's written by a student, uh, she was at MSU and she went out and interviewed them all. How they started to grow lentils and they built, um, what is the company called? Timeless. Timeless Seeds. Timeless. So you can buy their uh, lentils also in the natural food stores and you support them uh, that way. The story is amazing. I can only highly recommend it. We have nettle, we have yarrow, and I have elderflower here. I will pass that one around as well. Nettle is great for hair care if you find it here in Montana. Some people have patches of it, that's why I took it. You find the yarrow in abundance, it's great for pain. It is great for bug bites if you can put it on. Um, and elderflower is skin brightening. And with that, I want to conclude our uh, presentation. Do you have any more questions? What was the oil that you can find in Montana that you were saying? It is the safflower oil. And it's basically a thistle. And they ex get the oil out of that. It's a, like a flower that looks like a thistle. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.